We're gathered here this morning to celebrate the scholarly work of Tom Wright. His prolific and brilliant writings have reshaped the way that many of us read the New Testament. His books have situated Jesus and Paul squarely on the map of Second Temple Judaism, while at the same time showing how this historically particular reading of Jesus and Paul as first century Jews can also pay dividends for Christian theological interpretation. Tom has written extensively for both academy and church, and he has been one of our generation's most effective Christian apologists in a post-Christian culture. He's a devoted servant of the church, and he writes with grace, wit, and power. And so this large crowd of friends and appreciative readers has come to Wheaton this weekend to honor Tom Wright and his work. Yet at the same time, we've also come to reflect critically upon it. Those two aims, laudatory celebration and critical scrutiny, might seem to conflict, but in fact, they do not. The greatest honor that can be shown to a scholar is for his or her work to be engaged deeply and tested rigorously by colleagues. Adulation is for rock stars, but patient, searching, truthful dialogue is for those we love. As Grant has remarked, Tom has frequently told uh, all of us that uh, some high proportion of what he says is probably wrong, but he doesn't know which the wrong bits are. And so the essay that I offer today will seek to honor Tom as a true friend precisely by grappling with what I think might be a few of the wrong bits. <laughs> For more than 25 years, Tom and I have been allies in various battles within the field of New Testament studies. The two of us have been engaged in a long-running, mutually edifying conversation about the interpretation of Scripture. Each of us has frequently drawn on the other's writings for inspiration and instruction. I regard Tom not only as an insightful interpreter of the New Testament and an eloquent preacher of the gospel, but as one of my dearest friends in the world. It therefore came as a shock to me, and I think perhaps to him as well, when at the SBL meeting in Boston in 2008, Tom was on a panel and delivered a withering attack on my most recent book project. <laughs> the book was Seeking the Identity of Jesus, a Pilgrimage, co-edited by Beverly Roberts Gaventa and me. It was the subject of a review panel and Tom had been asked to be a respondent. I knew he would find things in the book to criticize, but I had expected that he would warmly welcome the book's fundamental approach and claims. That Jesus of Nazareth was a first century Jew whose life and teachings could be understood only within the context of Israel's history and Israel's scripture. That the identity of Jesus is reliably attested in the canonical gospels and not in extra canonical literature such as the various Gnostic gospels. That the Jesus we find in the canonical New Testament is rightly understood in the church's subsequent confessional traditions. That is, for example, the notion of Jesus as the incarnation of God is not simply a later fanciful aberration, but a faithful construal of the figure we actually encounter in the Gospels. That after his, resur I'm sorry, that after his crucifixion, Jesus was raised from the dead. And consequently, he's not only a figure of past history, but he remains a living presence in the community of his people. And finally, that knowing Jesus rightly requires a lifelong process of discipleship in which we are conformed to the pattern of his life so that we seek to embody God's will in the world. Or to put that last point in a Wrightian idiom, True beliefs about Jesus cannot be separated from praxis that seeks to implement Jesus' kingdom agenda. All this, I expected, would be profoundly congenial to Tom's own scholarly commitments and conclusions. Wouldn't you think so, hearing that summary? <laughs> but instead, Tom greeted the book with sharp criticism, chiefly because he saw its approach to seeking Jesus as insufficiently historical. Our pilgrimage, he said, 
was overdetermined by dogmatic concerns and theological traditions, and inattentive to the realities of first century history. Real pilgrims, Tom observed, would get their feet dirty on the dusty roads of ancient Palestine. But this book of essays was instead, quote, a pilgrimage by helicopter, end quote. <laughs> and its authors and editors were, quote, pilgrims with suspiciously clean feet, end quote. Tom does have a way with a phrase. <laughs> the result was therefore, and I quote, a pseudo-theological project of non-historical retrieval of Jesus, end quote. And much, much more in this vein. Now, my purpose <laughs> My purpose in recounting this tale of a surprising showdown at SBL is not to set the stage for a rebuttal. Instead, my purpose is to explain the background for some reflections about the relation between story and history in our effort to grasp the truth about Jesus. Tom's visceral reaction to seeking the identity of Jesus exposed for both of us a large area of previously undiscovered, or at least unexamined, differences. In our subsequent conversations, I learned to my surprise, for example, that he regards the theology of Karl Barth as the source of much mischief and error, and that he is deeply suspicious of the whole Barthian post-liberal project of narrative theology associated with the so-called Yale School of Theologians, such as Hans Frey and George Lindbeck. On his view, their intra-textual hermeneutical approaches lead to a denial of critical history, and they encourage detachment from the real world of historical events outside the text of the Bible. I, on the other hand, have been, prof as some of you know, have been profoundly influenced by Bart and his heirs, and I believe Tom's negative evaluation of them is based on an unfortunate caricature of their theology. And so the blow up in Boston, if I can call it that, <laughs> exposed some important fault lines in the alliance between Tom and me. Perhaps it was a little like the confrontation between Peter and Paul at Antioch. Tom believed I was not walking straight towards the truth of the gospel. Consequently, this argument has forced me to go back and reread Tom's work with new questions in mind to see what I had missed before. So the questions that will occupy us this morning are these. How are we to understand the relation between story and history? What roles, if any, do the church's scriptural canon and tradition play in helping us know the truth about Jesus? Is there a legitimate discipline of historical inquiry that can operate outside and apart from that tradition? And if so, what claim does such a discipline have on determining the ways in which Christians know Jesus? In what ways might the historical study of Jesus play a role in apologetics or in conversation with non-Christians? And finally, what is the significance of the resurrection of Jesus for our epistemology? Now to treat such huge questions is of course impossible uh, before the final buzzer sounds on me. So all I can hope to do this morning is to offer a few, uh, probably the final buzzer of my life as well, but the, the, uh, uh, all I can hope to do this morning is to offer a few summarizing observations and proposals. My remarks will proceed in three stages. One, I'll sketch the ways in which Tom approaches these issues of story and history. Two, I'll offer some reflections on the theological gains and losses entailed in Tom's working methodology. And then finally, I will venture some programmatic proposals about where we might go from here. So first, Tom's methods. The book in which Tom, of course, has most fully developed his account of the figure of Jesus is Jesus and the Victory of God. 
published in 1996. For purposes of present analysis, I want to highlight seven features of Tom's working method. And uh, in view of the time, I'm not going to explain all of these. I assume that you're well enough acquainted with his work that you'll under a phrase or two will evoke them. Number one, critical realism. Number two, hypothesis and verification. Now, I do want to say something about that. This aspect of Tom's method is one of the ways in which his approach to Jesus differs most significantly from that of m most other scholars. Studies of the historical Jesus usually apply various criteria that enable the sifting of individual sayings and narrative units in the Gospels, separating the authentic from the inauthentic, assigning various levels of probability to their claim of historical factuality. And of course, the Jesus Seminar's uh, notorious color-coded uh, edition of the five Gospels is a vivid visual representation of precisely that methodology. The usual procedure then is to extract a residue of critically assured units of tradition and build a picture of Jesus on that basis. But Tom rejects this whole approach out of hand. In, instead, his method aims at what he calls getting the evidence in. He takes the whole body of canonical traditions about Jesus and tries to develop a hypothesis about the identity of Jesus that will allow for maximum inclusion of all the data. He tries to make all the pieces of the puzzle fit together precisely as historically factual elements of the reconstruction. This is one of the reasons that many evangelicals love the book. Conversely, it's one of the things that causes some New Testament scholars in the academic guild to regard it with extreme suspicion. Third methodological uh, uh, feature of Tom's work is its skepticism about form and redaction criticism and about synoptic source criticism. He essentially rules out these methods as not helpful. Fourth, his extensive use of Second Temple Jewish material to characterize the cultural framework in which Jesus is to be read. Fifth, his exclusive focus, at least in Jesus and the victory of God, on the synoptic gospels as the source of evidence uh, and the exclusion of the Gospel of John, about which Marianne is going to speak in, in a few moments, so I won't say more about that. Sixth, what I will call inattention to the literary and theological shape of the individual Gospels. Even though uh, he's working with the evidence of the synoptics, Jesus and the victory of God shows little or no interest in the distinctive literary contours of the individual canonical Gospels, or even in the distinctive theological witness of the individual evangelists. In my judgment, this is a significant oversight, and I will have a little more to say about it in what follows. And finally, the seventh methodological observation is that what Tom is doing in this book is creating a reconstruction of a historical Jesus behind the canonical Gospels. Instead of attending to the portrayals of Jesus in individual New Testament texts, Tom aims instead at something else, a reconstruction of a figure behind the text, including the construction of an account about Jesus' own intentions and self-understanding. The synoptic gospel writers actually give us rather little direct access to such information. But Tom regards this sort of archeological work of recovery as an essential part of the work of the historian. <clears throat> So the Gospels themselves become not the focus of our attention, rather the Gospels become the windows through which Tom seeks to peer to find a Jesus outside and beyond the Gospels themselves. So that's a, a quick sketch of his working method. Now, these last two points inattention to actual gospels as literary texts, and reconstruction of a Jesus behind the texts seem a little odd given Tom's well-known and strong focus on story as a key to understanding Jesus, or indeed 
understanding history. But in fact, upon closer examination, we see that the story that is in Tom's viewfinder is not exactly any of the specific stories actually told by the evangelists. Rather, the story in which he's interested is a critically abstracted construct. It is the master meta-narrative of the Bible. It's Israel's grand story of creation, fall, covenant, exile, and return. More specifically, it is that meta-narrative as told from within the perspective of Second Temple Judaism's consciousness of exile and oppression, accompanied by a passionate hope for messianic deliverance. And so, in light of the methods he has employed, Tom arrives at the now well-known account of Jesus that he has offered with great passion and rigorous consistency over the past 20 years. Let's recall the key findings. The Jesus of Tom's historical reconstruction is a Jewish eschatological prophet who comes proclaiming the long-awaited coming of God's kingdom, the end of Israel's exile, and the return of Yahweh to Zion. Indeed, Jesus is not just proclaiming the return of Yahweh, he's embodying it, enacting it. In all this, I would suggest that there is at least some unresolved tension between what I will call theological and historical perspectives. In the book, The Meaning of Jesus, Two Visions, which Tom co-authored with Marcus Borg three years after Jesus and the Victory of God, Tom wants to say that history and theology are complementary. Indeed, both are necessary. And in Jesus and the Victory of God, Tom can even assert that theological exegesis can be achieved through the historical study of Jesus. It seems in principle that Tom's exposition of critical realism ought to allow faith a certain epistemological role by positing that we cannot avoid reading the evidence through the spectacles of our own worldviews. Yet in several weighty passages, he seems to suggest that faith can obscure real history or that hard-nosed history <clears throat> has a certain hermeneutical priority. Let me give you an example. There's a passage near the end of Jesus and the Victory of God in which Tom speaks of Jesus' awareness of vocation to enact a symbolic encoding of the return of Yahweh. Tom then distinguishes this claim sharply from Jesus having what he calls, quote, some supernatural awareness of himself as being in some ontological relation to Israel's God. Quote, Jesus did not know that he was God in the way that one knows one is male or female, hungry or thirsty, or that one ate an orange an hour ago, end quote. Rather, this is the sort of knowledge that can be discovered only by living into it, like the knowledge of being loved. This is something very different from what Tom calls, quote, pseudo-orthodox attempts to make Jesus of Nazareth conscious of being the second person of the Trinity, end quote. I'm interested in that description, pseudo-orthodox. <laughs> Christian theological tradition is by and large bracketed out, at least at the explicit level in Tom's treatment of the evidence. Or consider this passage on faith and history in The Meaning of Jesus. Quote, the Jesus I know in prayer, in the sacraments, in the faces of those in need, is the Jesus I meet in the historical evidence, including the New Testament, of course, but the New Testament read not so much as the church has told me to read it, but as I read it with my historical consciousness fully operative. In that formulation we hear, I think, a Tom Wright speaking who is still carrying the intellectual legacy of the liberal historicism of the first and second quests for the historical Jesus, the quests of the 19th and 20th centuries. The church, in passages like this one, offers chiefly an oppressive and misleading hermeneutical framework that obscures the real Jesus. And to discover that real Jesus, we must bracket out 
the churches received traditions about him and reread the New Testament with a fresh historical consciousness. Only then will we truly know Jesus in two ways, through our own experience and in our historical reconstruction. Now, I hope I'm not caricaturing the position. Tom will tell us later whether I am. <laughs> Tom does not always write about Jesus in these terms. I've obviously picked some neuralgic passages here. But it's one important strand of his working methodology, and this is certainly the Tom Wright who was speaking on that difficult day in Boston. Now, the bracketing out of the church's theological tradition is also suggested by two other important features in Jesus and the victory of God. One, the absence of the Gospel of John in the database used for the reconstruction of the historical Jesus, and two, the deferral of the resurrection to a subsequent volume. Tom might well plead that these deferrals are either strategic or simply necessitated by the huge scope of the topics. He did, after all, write something like 800 pages later on the resurrection. But I would still suggest that the omissions of John and the resurrection from Jesus and the victory of God are hermeneutically significant. Clearly, it makes a huge difference whether or not one reads the Synoptic Gospels in dialogue with John's proclamation that Jesus was the incarnation of the Lagos and in light of the resurrection as the true climax of the story. Perhaps I could put my point here simply as a question to Tom. Now that you have worked through the evidence and written a comprehensive study of the resurrection that concludes Jesus really was raised from the dead, should this finding retrospectively affect the content treated in Jesus and the victory of God? If you were going to revise that volume for a second edition now, almost 15 years later, would your assessment of the evidence be any different in light of the findings of the resurrection of the Son of God? I regret I'm not going to be able to stay for the panel discussion this afternoon. I, uh, uh, I meant to announce this in the beginning. My father-in-law died this week, and I have to be on the plane to Oklahoma for his funeral today. And so regrettably, this uh, paper is a little bit of a hit and run job, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I, get, I get to ask questions, but I don't get to stick around to hear the answers. Uh, but we'll find a time. Okay. It's now time to sum up what I've been observing and to reflect on what is gained and lost in Tom Wright's far-reaching and insightful account of the Jesus of history. First, the gains. As Jesus and the victory of God rolls on and the evidence accumulates page after page, we find that Tom has achieved some extraordinarily impressive results. His construction of Jesus is wide-ranging, eloquent, and cohesive. From a theological point of view, here are the major gains that I see. Number one, reading in historical context and depth. Tom narrates a Jesus who for the most part fits intelligibly into the history of Israel in the first century under Roman rule. Jesus' identity is thoroughly Jewish. Number two, recovery of the political and pragmatic character of the gospel. The Jesus who steps the Jesus who steps out of the pages of Tom's book is not an otherworldly apolitical figure. He fits within a vivid political landscape of pragmatic collaborators, resistance fighters, would-be messiahs, and others struggling to sort out the national identity of a people trodden down by pagan powers, but always dreaming that God would set them free and bring justice. Against this backdrop, Jesus' prophetic proclamation of the kingdom of God recovers its properly explosive political meaning. So Tom's work goes a long way to overcome the misguided modernist dichotomy between theology and politics. Third, the positive coherence of the synoptic storyline with the Old Testament and Israel. 
Tom's work goes a long way towards resolving the perennial problem of the relation between Old and New Testaments. The synoptic gospels on Tom's reading narrate a linear continuation of the storyline of Israel's national struggle and hopes. Tom's account deepens our understanding of the way in which the death and resurrection of Jesus is not simply a matter of saving individuals from their personal guilt. Instead, it is the culmination of God's astonishing cosmic plan to restore his covenant people and to bring salvation to the whole world. And that helps to bring the two testaments into a much deeper theological unity. Fourth, high Christology. Perhaps the most surprising theological outcome of Tom's historical construction is the way in which while working on what we might call a Christology from below, a Christology on the plane of historical events, it unexpectedly opens the door to the development of an exceedingly high Christology. Here is the now famous concluding passage of Tom's account of Jesus' beliefs about himself and his mission. Quote, I propose as a matter of history, as a matter of history, that Jesus of Nazareth was conscious of a vocation, a vocation given him by the one he knew as father, to enact in himself what in Israel's scriptures God, God had promised to accomplish all by himself. He, that is Jesus, would be the pillar of cloud and fire for the people of the new exodus. He would embody in himself the returning and redeeming action of the covenant God." End quote. If that is what Jesus thought about his own identity, the subsequent development of the church's worship of him becomes much more readily intelligible. Fifth, and finally on the gain side, from a theological point of view, one might hope, and I think Tom does hope, that his historical account of Jesus might have apologetic value and impact. He seeks to give us a historical narrative that takes in all the evidence and shows that the Gospels actually do give us a persuasive, coherent picture of what really happened in the life of Jesus. History wie es eigentlich gewesen ist. To the extent that Tom's construction works as secular history, it creates a bridge for dialogue with non-believers about Jesus. They can be invited to cross the bridge, to come and see who Jesus was without first having to surrender completely their own historical consciousness and worldview. I fear that this apologetic hope is illusory or at least exaggerated. But it may be the case that Tom's book really does serve a slightly different sort of apologetic function, as indeed so much apologetics does. It's not a sign for non-believers, but for believers. It may allow uncertain believers to gain greater confidence about the historical credibility of a story that they already haltingly believe on other grounds. Okay, that's a summary of the gains. What about some losses? Some of these may fit in the category of open questions rather than uh, losses. I think a full assessment of Jesus and the victory of God must reckon with some factors that have to be entered on the debit side of the theological ledger. Number one, as I've suggested already, within Tom's project, the individual voices of the synoptic gospel writers disappear. The distinctiveness of the testimony of each individual gospel witness is lost, or at least drowned out by Tom's synthetic re-narration of his account of Jesus. I think this is theologically regrettable, and it effectively turns back the clock and loses some of the very significant gains achieved by literary study of the Gospels over the past generation. As a reader of the New Testament, I want to hear the complex polyphony of the choir of singers, not just a critically extracted unison melody. And interestingly, this is the same judgment that the church historically made in deciding to have a fourfold gospel canon rather than a single gospel as Marcion wanted or 
a uh, harmony as Tatian wanted in his Dia Tesseron. The church insisted, no, it's important that there are four gospels and we need to hear each voice. Second, the reference to a critically extracted melody points to my second concern, which is the danger of over-systematization. The question that haunts many readers of Jesus and the Victory of God is whether Tom's synthetic construct is too clever by half, whether it obsessively forces all the evidence into the single mold of the exile and return pattern. The parade example is Tom's interpretation of the parable of the prodigal son as a story about Israel's exile and restoration. No matter how many times I read Tom's elegant treatment of the parable, I simply can't persuade myself that this is what Jesus meant when he told the story. I think there are two simple reasons for my incredulity. First, Luke, the one gospel writer who recounts this parable, does not seem to think it means what Tom thinks it means. This is an example of what I mean about hearing the individual voices. Luke contextualizes it within a controversy between Jesus and the Pharisees and scribes about Jesus' practice of eating with sinners. In Luke 15, the parable is one of a string of three parables following the lost sheep and the lost coin about mercy and forgiveness. And it requires a couple of tricky hermeneutical dance steps to get to Tom's reading about Israel's new exodus. I think he finally can get there only by assuming that the Jesus of history was really talking about national exile and return, but that Luke himself either failed to understand that or suppressed it deliberately. <laughs> Tom never actually puts it that way, but I think that's the implicit logic of the argument. It seems to me that what Tom really has done with this parable is to make a brilliant homiletical move showing how the parable of the prodigal son could function metaphorically to illustrate his own major theme of Israel's exile and return. But merely to show the aptness of the metaphor is not to demonstrate historically that Jesus used the parable that way. Second, Tom's reading of the parable is totally unprecedented in the whole history of interpretation. He points this out actually quite explicitly in his treatment of it. But perhaps this ought to suggest that we're dealing here not with a recovery of what Jesus really meant back in the first century, but instead with a wonderful flash of Tom's poetic insight, the sort of artistic poiesis that makes Tom such a fine preacher. All this third, now a third on the downside, all this raises the question of the relation of Tom's critical reconstruction of Jesus to the church's confessional tradition Tom sometimes seems to insist that his account as historical in character is somehow independent of that tradition. In the first place, I must say that I doubt that. Tom Wright has never come to the New Testament as a neutral historian, and certainly his own account of critical realism should suggest the same thing. He comes to the Gospels as a believing Christian. Even as a Christian trying to think historically, he's engaged in the project of faith-seeking understanding. But if that's the case, why not acknowledge that the church's tradition might provide aid rather than hindrance in seeking to understand the New Testament's witness about the identity of Jesus? I'm going to cut some things here. A fourth uh, criticism, a fourth downside, is that in Tom's project, there's a certain loss of clarity, not only about the role of tradition, but also about the role of canon as authoritative for theology or at least it seems to me this is a potential danger in the project. When we seek to know who Jesus is, how do we do that? Do we look to the narrative representations of Jesus in the canonical fourfold gospel? Or must we instead read Jesus and the victory of God to discover Tom Wright's reconstructed meta-narrative as the distinctively authoritative construal of Jesus' identity? The problem here is the one long ago identified by Martin Kaler. The critical historian becomes, in effect, a fifth evangelist, whose secondary reconstruction now becomes the center of authority, perhaps even displacing the very texts it seeks to interpret. 
One major difference between Tom and many other questers for the historical Jesus, such as Marcus Borg or John Dominic Crossan, is that Tom certainly does not intend to contradict or supplant the canonical accounts of Jesus. But at the end of the day, the more strongly Tom reemphasizes the distinctiveness of his reconstructive recovery of the historical figure of Jesus as theologically crucial, the more strongly Tom emphasizes that, the more acute the problem becomes. Well, where do we go from here? I have about 10 minutes, Grant. First, I'd like to arrange a conversation in the near future between my friends Tom Wright and Karl Barth. <laughs> Maybe I could invite both of them to dinner. If they should accept the invitation, here's how I would introduce the dinner table conversation. Carl, I want you to listen to this passage from Tom. Quote, those who have desired to explore and understand the incarnation itself have regularly missed what is arguably the most central, shocking, and dramatic source material on that subject, which if taken seriously would ensure that the meaning of the word God, and here with Tom's characteristic lowercase g, the meaning of the word God, be again and again rethought around the actual history of Jesus himself." End quote. And now, Tom, listen to this passage from Carl. Quote, the meaning of his deity, the only true deity in the New Testament sense, cannot be gathered from any notion of supreme, absolute, non-worldly being. It can be learned only from what actually took place in Christ, end quote. My point is a simple one. Tom and Carl ought to find they have more in common than Tom supposes. They are in full agreement, I think, that the incarnation forces us to rethink the very meaning of the word God. For in Jesus, God is concretely present in a very surprising way. The particularity of incarnation requires a fundamental reconfiguration of our understanding of God. God is made known precisely in Jesus, not through general speculation or natural knowledge. Consider the famous opening of Barth's Church Dogmatics, Volume 4, Part 1. Quote, the atonement is history. To know it, we must know it as such. To think of it, we must think of it as such. To speak of it, we must tell it as history. To try to grasp it as supra-historical or non-historical truth is not to grasp it at all. It is indeed truth, but truth actualized in a history and revealed in this history as such, revealed therefore as history." End quote. I would think Tom would applaud that. He's nodding. <laughs> Still, no doubt my two friends, Wright and Bart, would find plenty to argue about because they still differ on the hermeneutical issue of how it is we come to know the truth about this history, about this historical figure of Jesus in whom God is embodied. The second thing I want to say here is that we need to seek with renewed determination then to overcome the pernicious dichotomy between story and history. Tom and I agree about that. Why then have we somehow come to think differently about the proper way of relating story and history? In pondering this question, I came across a particularly telling autobiographical insight offered by Tom in the book, The Meaning of Jesus. He writes, quote, I react against attempts to pull me back into the old split level world with the vigor of one who does not want to be imprisoned again in the attic where faith is divorced from history or imprisoned in the dungeon where history is divorced from faith. This reaction will be understood perhaps by those who have experienced liberation from heavy handed traditional Protestantism or Catholicism." End quote. This may go some way, I think, towards explaining Tom's vehement response to the book Seeking the Identity of Jesus. He perceived in it an attempt to imprison him again in the attic. 
by banishing history and enforcing conformity to some sort of anti-historical anti disembodied faith. But I would suggest that nothing could be further from the truth. In a significant essay in Seeking the Identity of Jesus, the theologian Robert Jensen confronts exactly this issue and asks a provocative question, quote, but what if the church's dogma were a necessary hermeneutical principle of historical reading because it describes the true ontology of historical being, end quote. Now that's a typically lapidary Jensen sentence, but let me, let me try to paraphrase it. If it is true that Jesus was the incarnation of the word, the fleshly embodiment of the one through whom all things were made, and if it is true that he was raised from the dead by the power of God and now reigns over the whole world, whether the world acknowledges it or not, then it follows that the historical figure of Jesus cannot be rightly known or understood apart from the confession that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the incarnate word who is raised from the dead. This is where we ought to begin if we want to know the historical truth about Jesus. This is what it seems to me Tom's whole historical Jesus project doesn't ever quite take fully on board. The hypothesis that Tom seeks to verify by pulling together the evidence of the synoptics is not some naked inference from uninterpreted data. Rather, the hypothesis that Tom is testing is already encoded in the New Testament texts themselves as proclamatory stories and already, perhaps subconsciously, embedded in Tom's own worldview by virtue of, of his lifelong participation in a community that continues to retell the story. So the method of hypothesis and verification can't escape the hermeneutical circle, nor should it. Precisely because the church's dogma names a truth the world does not know, it rightly describes the truth about history in a way that a secularist historian is bound to miss. Another way to put this point is to affirm that the resurrection of Jesus is the epistemological key to understanding the world, and therefore the resurrection is the key to all history. If so, any history that does not begin from the vantage point of the resurrection of Jesus is perforce historically distorted because it denies or fails to grasp the deepest truth about the history of the world. Well, conclusion. The fault line between Tom and me on story and history is broadly emblematic of a pervasive ambivalence within contemporary evangelical Christianity. That's one of the reasons why I think it's important to do what might be thought of as airing the dirty laundry here this morning. But I think that there's, there's a deep ambivalence within evangelical Christianity itself over these issues. The des on the one hand, you have the desire for historical validation, historical validation of Christian claims, but that stands in tension, on the other hand, with a deeply felt desire for the postmodern recovery of canon and tradition as the necessary hermeneutical framework for understanding tradition and the world. Both Tom and I, I thought, want both things, but we have different ways of seeking to integrate them. On the one hand, Tom insists that without historical investigation of the Gospels, the story is vacuous and detached from the concrete reality of the world. I insist, on the other hand, that without the canonical form of the story, we could never get the historical investigation right in the first place. Throughout these critical reflections on Tom Wright's magisterial work, I have been seeking to extend a deep conversation between the two of us. That is to say, between the sort of colleagues whom Paul calls theou sunergoi, fellow workers belonging to God. Ultimately, that conversation will end, I trust, not like the testy confrontation between Peter and Paul at Antioch, 
but more like the meeting in Jerusalem that led to the mutual recognition of the grace of God given to each, culminating in the giving of the right hand of koinonia. In that spirit, may faith and history unite. May story and history meet and embrace. May Richard and Tom embrace and rejoice in the truth. Thank you.